Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor Jeshi. My last message on Song of Solomon. Oh, <laughs> but let it be the beginning of a fresh new journey of love with the Lord. I hope that as we've been through this, you'll begin to see it's uh, really something that's relevant for us today, not just in our human, you know, marital relationship, but also in our love relationship with, with the Lord. And with my whole heart, I believe it shows us a love journey that we are to go on. Uh, so, as I said before, what I'm sharing from the pulpit is a small little bit of the whole message. And if you want to go deeper, see, because I've been studying this and, look, and living this, really, since the 1990s, early 1990s. So, there's a lot of stuff that I have, which I'm not sharing now, but you can go online, go through my online course uh, and find out more details, and I encourage you to do that. So today, part 10, the last message, and I have entitled it, Lean on Me. Okay, Lean on Me. Those of you who are slightly older, maybe remember the song by Bill Withers in 1972. 1970s, the best decade for music. <laughs> 1972 by Bill Withers. Later, Michael Bolton did a cover of it in 1993, and maybe other covers have been done. Uh, the chorus goes something like, I need somebody to lean on, lean on me. It's very interesting, the chorus there, I need somebody to lean on. That's our cry. And then the voice comes from heaven, lean on me. Lean on me. Jesus wants us to lean on him. And really, this is the main aim of of the Song of Solomon. The main goal that he's leading us to and revealing us prophetically in the Song of Solomon is that we are to get to the point where we're leaning fully on our beloved. Amen? This journey of love that we have been through, there's five seasons that I've taken you through. We come to the last season today. Premature love, possessive love, painful love, powerful love, and now we come into perfecting love. Notice I don't say perfect love because I don't believe this side of heaven we're going to be perfect. We can be sinless in the sense that we sin less and less and less until he comes back. But when he comes back, we have a new resurrection body, then we will be perfect. But it, this side of heaven, we are being perfected. And in the Bible, whenever it says, be perfect as I am perfect, God says, be perfect as I am perfect. It doesn't mean without sin, perfect in every single way. The biblical use of perfect means mature. So basically, he's saying, be mature, be like Christ. And that's, that's what our call is. And we can be like Christ by leaning more and more and more on him. And this is the destination for our love journey, leaning fully on him and co-laboring with him. So in this last section, which is in chapter 8 of Song of Solomon, we see that finally she comes out of the wilderness leaning on him, and then she's working with him in the vineyard that's been prepared for her. Previously, we've seen in chapter 1 that she has been forced to work in a vineyard that was not hers. Her family has forced her out of anger to, to do something that was not right in the vineyard that she was not prepared for. So she was ministering in a place which was not prepared for her. But now she comes to the point where she's ministering in the right place. And she's being very fruitful with her beloved. So this is a beautiful image of really the call God has on each one of our life in this love journey that he's taking us through. So in this fifth season of love, perfecting love, this is the season of love where the bride is fully mature in her love with the beloved, leaning 100% on him and fully doing his will with great fruitfulness. And this is what God is calling each one of us to do. How much are you leaning on Jesus? How much are you trusting in him? And as we will see, the extent that you lean on him and trust on him will be the extent that you will be able to, to enter into the fullness of his purposes. 
So let's go into this final section, leaning on him. So here in chapter 8 and verse 5. Okay, so it's just after we hear the, the command, do not stir up or awaken love until it so desires. And that divides it into the different sections, the five sections. And here you see the daughters of Jerusalem sing out. Remember, this is a song. So you, it's good when you read it, try and sing it. Even when you read the Psalms, try and sing through the Psalms because they're, they're actually songs. They're meant to be sung out. So here you find the daughters of Jerusalem, and I've told you before, these represent those that are seeking the Lord, those that are, are with the, the bride and seeking him, seeking the beloved. Who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? Who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? So the cry is, who's this coming out of the wilderness? They see a couple coming out of the wilderness. It's the bride, the Shulamite woman and Solomon, and she's leaning fully on him. They're coming out of the wilderness. Now, it's interesting that this term, who, who, this question, who is this coming out from the wilderness, has been asked before in the Song of Solomon. In chapter 3 and verse 6, if you go back there, that's the time where the, the Shulamite woman is in her comfort zone in the mother's chambers, and she's dreaming, and she has a dream of the bridal procession. And the question is asked there, who's this coming out of the wilderness? And the answer is Solomon with all of his mighty army surrounding him. And he's in the, in the palanquin, which is the, the handheld chariot that would often be used in marriages, especially for a king. So it was the bridal procession, but it was the procession without the bride. They were coming to the bride's house to pick her up. Now, in Jewish culture, that's what happens the, the bridegroom will go out of the house and will be having a palanquin, having a chariot, or sometimes they'll just have a, a covering called a chupa. And they will be going to the bride's house to receive her. And then they will go to the new house prepared for them after that. And so this is in chapter 3, verse 6. That question was asked, who is this coming up from the wilderness? But it was only the bridegroom. Now... Who is this coming up from the wilderness? It's both of them coming together. So they've been united in their love. And you see that she's leaning on him. Now, who is this coming up from the wilderness? You know, wilderness in the Old Testament had two main meanings. The first meaning of wilderness was related to the 40 years of wandering of the Israelites in the wilderness. It was a time of trials and testing. So the wilderness is a symbol of trials and testing. But also the prophets, such as the prophet Joel, used wilderness as a curse, a place of curse. So here you see the bride, the Shulamite woman, which represents us, the church, is finally coming out of the wilderness. She's coming out through from the trials, from the testings, from the curses of her life. She's coming into that place where she is co laborer with her beloved, where she is victorious. So it's a picture of us as God's people coming out of the wilderness. All of us have to go through a wilderness if we are to mature in Christ. And that wilderness may be the testings the Lord will take us through and allow us to go through. For the woman we saw, the testings were that he withdrew his presence from her because she, there was a lot of selfishness in her life. And so she had to learn to overcome areas of sin in her life and selfishness and be cleansed. And there was a lot of pain involved in that as a testing and trial. She was even beaten up by the watchmen. So she suffered persecution. She suffered hurt from people who she had trusted in before. And often you find the Lord will allow you to go through times of trials and tribulations and testings to mature you. Either you run away from it into your comfort zone and you try and hide away, or you endure as the woman did. We see the Shulamite woman, she not only endured, but she endured with thanksgiving and praise, which is what we've been learning about. In the midst of the pain, she praised him. She spoke out how great her, her lover was, warrior king, king of kings, lord of lords. She lifted up her praise. So God is calling us out of the wilderness 
but we have to go through the wilderness. And the wilderness can be firstly trials and tribulations. It can also be curses, delivering us from curses. What were the curses that the Shulamite woman was under? She was under curses from her background, from her upbringing. There was insecurities. There was rejection. There was fear. And I've talked about all of these things before that she had been through. But she, she was allowing her beloved to take her through a process of deliverance. It's the same with us. God wants to deliver us and heal us and set us free so that we lean on him more and more and more. Amen? Do you want to lean on him more and more and more? The more we lean on him, the more he will lead us into the harvest fields. The more he will awaken us. It says here, I awakened you under the apple tree. There your mother brought you forth. There she who bore you brought you forth. He's actually talking about her her physical birth and relating it to the new birth that she's had of love with him. I awakened you under the apple tree. This takes us all the way back to Song of Solomon chapter 2 verse 3 where in premature love we see that she's spending time in the presence of her beloved and he is called like an apple tree. An apple tree where she can come under his shade and protection and find nourishment by eating of his fruit. And so here she's, the beloved saying to her, I awakened you under the apple tree. When did she first start to learn to lean on him? It was under the apple tree. That is, the apple tree is a symbol of the devotional life that we have with our Lord Jesus Christ. In the Western world, very often, there's a picture of of Eve eating the apple from the forbidden fruit. But let me tell you, the forbidden fruit was not an apple. In Song of Solomon, the the apple is used as a beautiful symbol of love, the love relationship we have with Jesus. That as we come into that devotional life with Jesus, he's like an apple tree to us. We can find protection under his branches, and we find nourishment by eating the fruit of his presence. Do you know that in Jewish teaching, do you know what the actual forbidden fruit is more likely to be? It doesn't say in the scripture, but it's more likely to be figs. Why? Because after they had sinned, they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves, maybe from the forbidden tree, so that it's not apple. The apple is a a symbol of devotional life with the Lord. I awaken. That's where we find our awakening. How many, when you're learning physics, you learned about Isaac Newton? Where did he receive the revelation of gravity? Under the apple tree. At least that's the legend. There's a lot of truth to it, but in the legend it goes that he was sitting under the apple tree and an apple fell on his head as he was musing about physics and and suddenly had a revelation of gravity. And then from that comes the three laws, Newton laws of motion. Um, Probably it didn't hit his head. Probably he was, yes, he may have been sitting under an apple tree and he saw an apple fall and he had the revelation about gravity. Okay, without that we, we, we probably wouldn't be where we are today. And so, and what, are he, what was he doing under the apple tree? He was leaning, leaning on the, the trunk of the apple tree. Amen? He's talking about us. We need to spend time in the presence of Jesus, leaning on him, reading his words, spending time praying and seeking his face. And as we do that, he will give us revelation. Maybe not gravity, not that. <laughs> But there will be things which he will show to us and guide us and lead us. And and he will mature us as we spend time under under the apple tree. So you find that she was awakened in that place. And because she went through the dealings of her beloved, she was able to come out leaning on him like this. So, So there's the apple tree. So we need to have the apple tree experience. Do you have the apple tree experience? Daily coming, sitting under his presence, eating of his goodness. His goodness is found in his word. Eating an apple could be like reading the word of God. How many of you experience, as you read the word of God, there's nourishment that comes. Every day as I now read the 10 chapters, there's something that speaks to me from the Lord that gives me nourishment and strength to go through the day. Amen? 
and I find myself able to lean more on the Lord. So it's not that we'll be perfectly leaning on the Lord 100%, but step by step, He wants us to lean. What does leaning on Him mean? To trust in Him, to trust that He will lead us, to trust that He will heal us, to trust that He will guide us every day. So this is a, a very beautiful lesson. We, we need to learn to lean on Him under the apple tree. That is in our devotional lives. And not lean on other things. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. Let's read this together. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him and He will make your path straight. Amen? So trust in the Lord is the same as saying leaning on the Lord. Lean on the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. And lean not on your own understanding. So we can trust either in the Lord or we trust in other things. Our own understanding. What does that mean? Our own educational background. Our own patterns of thinking. The own, our own ways of coming up with answers to solutions to problems. We're not to lean on human strength and resources. It could be our own strength and resources. It also could be strength and resources of other people around us. So we're not to lean on. Yes, there are good things, but we're not to lean on them. We're not to lean on our education. We're not to lean on our money, how much money we have in our bank account. We're not to lean on our social standing, our upbringing, our power, our authority. Those are not things we're to lean on. We're to lean on the Lord Jesus Christ and on him alone. Amen. Now, these lessons I've had to learn through the years, and I failed sometimes. Before I was working full-time for the church, I was in a mission organization, living by faith. And when people say, in a mission organization, living by faith, it, it means literally you have to pray the money in. There's no money that is promised by the organization to give you as a salary. You have to pray, and the Lord will touch people's hearts, and they will give monthly a certain amount of money. And I found that as I prayed and trusted in the Lord, every time the Lord would provide, sometimes just enough, other times more than enough, but never lacking. But the moment I started to place my eyes on the people as the source of provision, I, I, I would think, oh, this person's always provided this amount every month. Uh, you know, maybe uh, I, I just call them up, spend a bit more time, they'll give a bit more. If I did that, often that source of provision would completely dry up. They would stop giving altogether. <laughs> but the, the time where I just said, Lord, I trust in you. Whoever you want to touch to give, I just believe and trust in you. You will give through whatever source. It could be the ravens just coming to drop something, dropping the money into my house. I trust in you. And every time I trusted like that, the provision came in. The moment I... I started trusting in other things, in the people, in my own, sometimes in, in my own savings or whatever it may be. If I put my trust in those things, it would just dry up. But when I trusted in the Lord, it never dried up. Amen. Now, these, these all the way through Scripture, actually, this is a lesson, especially in the Old Testament to the kings. The moment the kings of Israel started to put their trust in nations around them, what happened? the nation started to fail. The provision started to fail. There's one example during the reign of King Hezekiah. And King Hezekiah, the prophet Isaiah was during that time. And Isaiah would come to him, and he came to him quite a few times telling King Hezekiah, don't trust in Egypt. Don't put your trust, because Hezekiah was putting his trust in Egypt for certain resources and provisions. And, it, and Isaiah warned him, don't do that. But he, he did. Hezekiah did that. And finally, the, the Syrian armies came in, and there was one of uh, King Sennacherib's spokesmen came up, and in uh, Isaiah 36, verse 6, he comes to Hezekiah and the people, and he says, Look, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed, Egypt, on which if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. 
So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. So even the enemy was used to warn Hezekiah, don't trust in Egypt, because if you do, it's like putting your hand on a, a reed that has a sharp point. It will just go through your hand and hurt you. If you put your trust in anything other than in God, you will be hurt. You will be hurt. Amen. Only God is fully trustworthy. People will always let you down. There's no person who is fully, fully trustworthy. Of course, there are people more trustworthy than others, and at certain times we have to trust. But ultimate trust is in God and God alone. Amen? I'll say that again. Ultimate trust is in God and God alone. I was reading a story about this missionary called John G. Patton. Anyone heard of him? John G. Patton. He was a missionary to the South Pacific Islands, in those days called the New Hebrides. Now it's uh, Zanuatu, or Van, Vanuatu. And he was from Scotland. The G in the middle of John G. Patton is Gibson. Same as my, I, I, my uh, ancestors come from Scotland, so probably I'm related to this guy. And he had a very godly father who prayed for him and really, really taught him to have a living relationship with God. Three days he would meet in the, pri- in, the, in the prayer closet with the Lord, and he was head over heels in love with the Lord. And you read his autobiography, you can just see the, the amount that he knows he's loved by God. And it caused him to want to just serve God and to do whatever, wherever God would lead him. In the end, God led him to go to the South Pacific Islands. Firstly, he was like an inner city missionary in Glasgow. But then he started having a call to go to these islands where, you know, the inhabitants of these islands, they were cannibals. You know, cannibals, those that eat human flesh. So it's not an easy place to go. And he went there just after he'd been married to his wife, Mary. And when they got there, after just a few months, Mary gave birth to their child, Peter. But then, just a few weeks later, Mary died of a disease that she got in the islands. And then a few weeks after that, Peter also died. So he had to bury his wife. He had to bury his son. But he stayed on. And he stayed on for 15 years. His house was burnt down by the locals but he was not eaten up by them. But he loved the Lord so much. Every day he spent time in God's presence and God was just teaching him and leading him. And he's learning the language during this time. But after 15 years, he had to leave because the the tribal groups were getting too dangerous for him and the people he was working with. And so he went to another island. After that, he also went to Australia where he was going to the churches and really encouraging them to, to go out in missions. But then he was called back to the islands, to another island. And during this time, this is where he started to write the Bible or the New Testament in their own language, which he had been learning in the first 15 years. And he was writing down. He came to the Gospel of John, and he found the word that John uses for to believe or to trust, which is pistuo. And he, he couldn't find a word for it in their language because there was no word for trust. You know, if you live among cannibals, you're not going to trust anybody (laughs) because they might eat you the next day and you might be their breakfast. There's no word at all in their language for trust. And so he was just thinking, racking his brain, what word to use? And he saw his uh, helper coming in who was actually an indigenous, a tribal person. And he just leant back on his seat, put up his legs, and he said to the, the tribal person, what am I doing? And so the tribal person used a word which, which literally meant putting my, his full weight upon something, to put his full weight. Let's see if I can get out uh, here. Okay, I've lost where I am. Or to lean your whole weight upon something. And he thought, wow, trust, to trust in the Lord is to lean my whole weight, just like me on a chair, putting up, I'm trusting completely in that chair. Just think, if I try and lean on this, yes, 
it's a bit shaky. <laughs> There's a times maybe I lean a bit too much to the left, I'll fall over. If I lean on this table, it's, gonna, it's very shaky, it will fall over. But if I was to lean on a chair, it's made for the whole purpose of supporting a human. And we are, the only thing we can truly lean on and trust in 100% is in Jesus himself. Amen? And so John G. Patton used that in his New Testament translation. And after that, the translation went out. And the whole, they, they, they reckon that the whole island he was on all became Christian. Before, they were all cannibals. And then the other islands started becoming Christians. To this very day, you can find a huge Christian community in the South Pacific Islands. Amen? Because this man knew his love relationship with the Lord. And he was leaning 100%, trusting 100% in the Lord. Even though he'd been through trials and tribulations, his wife dying, his son dying, he'd been through those, all those things, and yet he was able to continue and to grow in his love for the Lord Jesus. Why? Because he was trusting in him 100%. Amen? So don't lean on your own understanding, but trust in the Lord with all your heart. And how, how can we do that? Why do we trust? Why do you trust someone? You trust someone because you love them. But why do you love them? You love them because you know that they love you. Amen. You trust someone. You can lean on someone that you know truly loves you unconditionally. They truly love you, and you can trust them to lean on them, and they will not let you down. And so if we are to lean on him, we must know we are loved by him. This is a very important fact. If you, the more you know you're loved by God, the more you will lean on him. Not the more you love him or you think you love him, the more you know he loves you. This is a very, very important thing. That's why here the Shulamite starts to sing about the power of love, the power of her beloved love. And I love this little passage here because this was actually put on the bookmark during our wedding. This is the theme of our wedding. So the Shulamite sings this to her beloved. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is as strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. So here you see the first thing, his love seals us. Set me as a seal. So she's asking, Lord, let me be a seal on your heart and a seal on your arm. Now, I'm not saying, let me be a seal, ow, 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 like the, the seal you find in the sea. No, this is the, a seal of wax that was often put upon a person's most possessed, pos uh, valued possession. To, so to be set on something as a seal, is, it means it's the very, very precious possession of that person, and they will seal it so that other, others can see it belongs to them. Amen? So what she's asking for is, may I be your most valued possession? Possess me, my beloved. Remember at the beginning she said, my beloved is mine, and I am his. So she was possessing him. And then she switched it around later. She said, I am my beloved, and he is mine. Still there's a bit of possession there. But in the end she says, I am my beloved, and his desire is towards me. The most important thing to her was not to possess him, but to be possessed by him. That his desire, his love was poured out to her. Therefore, she was his most valued possession. Do you know that in your heart, that you are the most valued possession of Jesus? You are the most valued possession that he has. His bride, his church, us, we are his most valued possession. Set, so let, let's say, set me as a seal on your heart. That is in his thoughts. The heart speaks about thoughts and intentions. And as a seal on your arm, which means in act, action as well. 
because it's him who works in us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So as we, as we begin to see that we are so precious in the sight of the Lord, he loves us so, so much. His thoughts are towards us. We will start to do what he wants. We will start to do his work that he's prepared beforehand from the beginning of time. And then he goes on. Love seals us, but love also is strong. There's a power in love. For love is as strong as death. Jealousy as cruel as the grave. What does that mean? It doesn't mean love will kill us. What it means is love, just like death, is universal, irresistible, possessive. Death will always come after everyone. No one is going to avoid death unless Jesus comes back. Now remember, this is in the Old Testament. Love is as strong as death. In the New Testament, love is greater than death. Because Jesus has overcome death, and he is love. He has demonstrated to us love. Revelation, uh, Romans 8, 38, 39, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present or the future, or any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Amen? So love is strong. It's the imagery used here, strong as death. And it's a most vehement flame, flames of a fire. And in the original Hebrew, it's literally the very flame of Yahweh, the very flame of the Lord. This is talking about passion. Next year, we're going to start by talking about what it is to have passion. If you want passion, you need the love of God poured out in your heart. It's like a flame. And how do we get the flame of God, that's the love of God, coming into our life? Through offering ourselves our heart as the altar, the prayer altar, lifestyle. Daily coming and bathing in his presence under the apple tree. And he will start sending his fire into our heart, his passion, his love. Many waters cannot quench this love. So in other words, all the waters of the earth can't quench his love. Isn't that amazing? Nothing can separate us from his love. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. That means his love is more special than all the billions, trillions, millions of dollars you can have. You could, all the biggest house you could have, the biggest mansion, the best cars. His love is more important than that. Isn't that wonderful? And nothing can separate us from that love. That love is what will keep us strong. To be able to lean upon him, to be able to go through trials and tribulations and come out victorious. His love is what will help us through. To me, that's so wonderful. Well, before, just before I go into the next point, there's a few quotes that I'd like to, to quote to you. The first quote is from Brennan Manning, who wrote a book called The Ragamuffin Gospel. And this is his quote. He says, I am now utterly convinced that on Judgment Day, when the Lord Jesus will ask one question and only one question, do you know what that question will be? It's not how much did you love me. It's not how much did you do for me. When Jesus comes on judgment, he will not ask, how many great things have you done for me? How many souls have you brought into the kingdom for my sake? Do you know what he will ask? He will ask, did you believe I loved you? Did you believe I loved you? How much do you believe and live out that the Lord loves you? So many people, they can't grasp that God really loves them deeply because they've had rejection in their lives, in their families, in their workplace, at school. And they can't really believe God loves them to a great extent. Maybe God loves me a little bit, but he doesn't love me in this area, in this area, in this area. Let me tell you, God loves you completely and utterly. And he died for you on the cross. He laid down his life for you. He, he demonstrated his love. He didn't just say, I love you. He demonstrated that he loved you. Isn't that amazing? So what, 
will lead us into fully trusting the Lord Jesus and leaning on Him, not on our own understanding, not on other things, is how much we really believe He loves us. How much do you believe He loves you? Henry Nguyen, a Christian theologian, said, if you feel loved, you can do a thousand things. If you feel rejected, everything becomes a problem. I'll read that again. If you feel loved, you can do a thousand things. If you feel rejected, everything becomes a problem. You become a problem. And the rejected people reject. Hurt people hurt other people. But people who have experienced the love of God love others. We love because he first loved us, 1 John 4, 19. So how do, how do we love others? It's by receiving his love. How do we receive his love? It's by spending time in his presence. It's being healed in his presence. It's being set free in his presence. It's by bathing in the waterfall of his love and allowing his love to come and heal us and restore us. I've experienced that in my own life. I can remember the times where I was maybe trusting the Lord 50%, not so much. Other times I was trusting in my own intellect, my own way of work, going ahead in, in planning things. And it's during those times that there's a lot of insecurity within me and a lot of feeling of rejection. And there's still the remnants of those things in my life even to this very day. But I found out that the more I spend in the presence of God just receiving his love and being set free and being healed and being cleansed in his presence, the more I'm able to trust him and the more I trust him, the more he will give me breakthrough. The more he will lead me out of the wilderness into his purposes. The more he will give me his joy and freedom and liberty. So leaning on him, how do, we, how do we lean on him? That is, how do we trust him more? It's by receiving more of his love. And as we receive more of his love, we can start to labor like him because we'll become more and more like him and if you think about it that image of the woman leaning on her beloved if you're leaning on someone wherever that person goes say I'm leaning on somebody right now I'm leaning on the Holy Spirit wherever the Holy Spirit goes I will go with them <laughs> I'm leaning and they start moving in this direction I'll go in this direction I'm leaning this way and they start pulling me this way and they pull me into the purposes, the fields, the vineyards. You know, if I lean on Jesus, he will start to pull me into the area of ministry he has for me. Matthew 11, 28, verse 30. Remember Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28, what does that say? Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30. What does it say? Talking about taking up the, his yoke, which is easy and light. It's talking about coming to him. Come to me, you who are weary, who labor and are wearied, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon yourself, which is easy and light. Do you know what a yoke is? In the, times, in the Bible times, even today, you have yokes where you put across a, a, a the oxen, where you've got two oxen which are yoked together. The yoke is the, the wooden structure that links them together so that they can go and plow fields, so that they can do work together. Jesus is saying, be yoked to me. Lean on me. Be with me. But with him... His yoke is easy, which means we don't have to do much of the work. He does the work through us, and we just follow. We just trust in him. He will lead us and guide us in the right way. So here you find laboring like him. The daughters of Jerusalem come, 
And they sing, we have a little sister, she has no breast. What shall we do for our sister in the day that she is spoken for? If she is a wall, we'll build upon her a battlement of silver. If she is a door, we'll enclose her with boards of cedar. And then the Shulamite sings, I am a wall, and my breasts are like towers. Then I became in his eyes as one who found peace. This is very interesting. Here, the daughters of Jerusalem come and say, hey, Shulamite, we have all these young, this little sister. In other words, a a little baby or a, a very young child that's not matured at all. And of course, this is talking about spiritually those young believers that need nurturing, that need to to grow up in the Lord. It says that if she's a wall, we will build upon her battlements of silver. And the word there, battlement of silver, is like a tower of silver. And to the Jewish mind, this actually speaks of the, the wedding headdress of the Jewish woman. If you see it, a picture of the ancient Jewish wedding headdress, it was this huge tower with all silver coins on it, on her head. And so what it's saying here, if she's a wall, in other words, if she is a strong, very secure, very stable person, then she will be married. She will have that wedding headdress on her. But if she's a door then we have to enclose her. We have to restrict her with boards of cedar. We have to discipline her, in other words. So there are two kinds of people that we can disciple and we can bring up, even in our own life. We can either be a wall or we can be a door. A wall means stable, secure, trusting. Can you you lean on a wall? Yes, you can lean very strongly on a wall can lean on this and I won't fall over. But can you lean on the door for a while? Okay, you're leaning on the door, but then the door opens up. You fall through the door. This talks about believers who are leaning on something very insecure. And the moment fear opens up the door, they fall over. The moment insecurity, rejection comes into their life, the door opens, and insecurity, rejection comes and overwhelms them, and they fall over and they crumble. But the Shulamite woman said, I am a wall. In other words, she said, I have gone through the testing of, the, of my beloved, and I have come out as a strong wall. So what she's saying is, I'm in that place where I can trust in the Lord 100%. I can trust and lean on him, and I will not fall over. She's been, previously she was a door. She was a door because there were insecurities in her life, rejection in her life, fear in her life. But she allowed the Lord to take her through the the training, through the trials to come out as gold. Now she's saying, I am a wall. And so the the door talks about open to negative influences, whereas the wall is a strong and powerful person against the enemy. And so we are to disciple others to be walls, not doors in this illustration here. Amen? So let me ask you a question. Are you a wall or are you a door? How strong is your wall? And can you be nurturing others to be walls and not doors? That is discipleship. So God's ultimate aim is for us to be strong walls that others can lean on for a while, discipling them, and then we can teach them to lean on Jesus to receive his love and to lean on him and to go into his fields. So the wall of faith, as I call it, is actually made up of the different stages, the different seasons. So the first season, premature love, is the foundation. Without this, you can't build upon the wall. This is fervent love, intimacy with him. The first love that I looked at, premature love. This this must be the foundation of our Christian life. That is intimacy with the Lord Jesus, time in his presence, time reading his word, time praying and seeking his face, time just bathing and receiving his love. And then stage two is as we are spending time in his presence, he will start to reveal to us our selfishness, our sin in our life. 
And this is a bit like a, a cleaning of a window. If you think of cleaning of a dirty window, if you get the cloth with the water and you start wiping the dirty window, what happens? After a while, you can start seeing through the window. You start to have vision. You start to see through and see what, what is beyond that window. In the same way, as we allow Jesus to cleanse us and to heal us, we'll start to hear his call upon our life. This is the time where the Shulamite woman started to heal, hear the call. Springtime is here. Come forth. Come out. It's, it's the time of singing has come. And so this is the second. The second stage is is a purging, a purifying. So the first stage is passion, coming into a passionate relationship with the Lord. The second stage is purification, being purified through the precious blood of Jesus. The third stage, that's painful love, is going the way of the cross, going through trials and suffering and not giving up, but instead coming out with praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. So this is going the way of the cross. It says that Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. So even though he was going to the cross, there was deep-seated joy within his heart. Thanksgiving and rejoicing. You know, as he was going to the Garden of Gethsemane, they were singing songs of praise. He was leading them in these songs of praise. So this is the third level, the third layer of the wall. The fourth layer of the wall is powerful love. This is where she's been through a passionate relationship with him and then dealing with sin in her life and then enduring, persevering, the time of persevering through to the time of praise. And then she's starting now to become that mighty warrior, that mighty army, taking her place, taking her place with her beloved. And this is where she finally leans on her beloved and then starts to come out into perfecting love, which is trusting 100% fully moving in his will. She starts to, as we, as we saw, she comes into the, the garden, into the vineyard, where he is calling her. So this is the wall that we are to build up in our Christian life. But unfortunately, many of us, we have shaky walls. We have walls that will fall down. Actually, I, wanted to, I tried to find some building blocks, children's building blocks made of wood to use as an illustration, but I couldn't find them. Okay, so instead, I, I drew the picture here. So this is a picture of an unhealthy wall. So here, you look at premature love at the bottom. It's not that long, right? It's quite small. Even possessive love as well is not that big. So this is a person who hasn't been really spending time seeking the Lord, being in his presence. And they've not been through times of soul searching and repentance and cleansing. But, and also painful love is very small as well, which means they've, they've not been allowing Jesus to to discipline them and take them through trials. They've been living more in comfort. So not really spending much time in God's presence, not really reflecting on their sin, and not really uh, you know, enduring trials and tribulation, just living a good Christian life, coming to church regularly. And their powerful love is very big. In other words... They've, they've placed themselves. I say place themselves because it's not God placing them. <laughs> they've thought, this is my area of ministry. It may be their area of ministry, but it's, they're not ready for it. And, but they put themselves in that area of ministry, and they're ministering until they're burnt out. <laughs> and it may be the area God has called them to, but they're not ready for it. I remember when I was at Bible school in the early 1990s, suddenly there's so many big names, big Christian names that you hear, this person has fallen into adultery, this person has mismanaged or stolen finances, and suddenly the whole ministry crump just crashes down to the ground. It's like a wall that just crashes down. Why? There's one recent film about Jimmy Backer and Tammy Faye. It's called Tammy Faye's Eyes. And it's quite a negative film in the sense it puts a very negative view on Christianity. But it, it does look into the background. It shows that Jimmy Backer, you know, this man who started to uh, start uh, the pray, is it one of the, the praise ministries in Christian television. He became multimillionaire, built this huge uh, entertainment, Christian entertainment park. But you see, if you look at in, under the surface, he, he wasn't spending time in the presence of God. 
He didn't believe in repentance. He was always declaring that he was, you know, he was greatly blessed by God. He was greatly used, going to be greatly used by God and all these things he was declaring. And for a while he was. For a while all the riches started pouring in. But then the cracks started coming in the wall because he started to mismanage the finances. And he was found out. And they found out that a lot was siphoned into his own life and into building his own houses and everything. And in the end, he was put in prison. And I remember the time when it happened. You know, he was a, a mighty, so-called mighty man of God that everyone looked to, and suddenly he, he fell like this. Why? Because his wall was not strong in its foundations. We must build a proper wall with strong foundations. Otherwise, what will happen... So here, this is a person who thinks they have powerful love. He thinks they're in the right place. God has placed them, and they're working very hard. But ultimately, it's all going to crash down. Whereas the strong, healthy wall here, you see, is where the premature love is the biggest. In other words, passion is the greatest in this person's life. Spending a lot of time just being loved by God, just receiving his love and being filled up by his love. Possessive love is also growing, which means there's purification, a time of cleansing, and time of starting to hear what God's call is in their life. And then painful love is also a bit bigger, but not as big as the other two. So this is a, this is a healthy wall. So do you see this? What does your wall look like? If you go to my website, I actually have a questionnaire with many questions, and then you actually fill in the wall, your, your faith wall, what your faith wall looks like. And you can be shot. Sometimes your wall is not as strong as you think it is. <laughs> but don't worry. Even if your wall is like that on the left, there is hope. You know, even Jimmy Backer, he was restored. He came back into ministry. So the question to you is, what is your wall like? And if you have a strong wall, that means you trust in Jesus. You're leaning on him 100%. Then you'll find you'll be released into the ministry God has for you. So let's read the final part, which is really the conclusion of the song. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Hamon. He leased the vineyard to keepers. Everyone was to bring for its fruit a thousand silver coins. My own vineyard is before me. You, Solomon, may have a thousand, and those who tend its fruit, two hundred. So here is saying Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Hamon. And Baal Hamon literally means Lord of the multitudes or Lord of the harvest. He is Lord of the harvest. And he wants to lead us into the area of ministry that he's prepared before us since the time began. Amen. Like Ephesians 2.10 says that we have works prepared beforehand, that he has prepared beforehand, that we may walk in those works. He leased the vineyard to keepers. Everyone was to bring for its fruit a thousand silver coins. My own vineyard is before me. So now she's saying, I finally found my own vineyard. This is the area that really I am to minister in. This is me. This is what God has made me to be. He's made me to be in this particular ministry. And I am here because I've leaned on him 100%. I've been through the trials. I've been through the fires and come forth as gold. Amen. And it says, what do I receive for it? A thousand silver coins. So he is saying those that have these vineyards, which talks about our areas of ministry, will receive a thousand silver coins. But what happens to those silver coins? You, Solomon, may have a thousand. In other words, I give you it all. I give you everything. So how much is she giving to the Lord? A hundred percent. How much does she receive back? It says, and those who tend it will have two hundred so she gets 20% back. So in effect, she's given 80%. Isn't that amazing? Of course, we know in Scripture it talks about giving of the tithe, 10% of our income to the Lord. But you know that's just the basics. That's just the, the, the very mere bottom of our giving should be 10%. Do you know that John Wesley, when he died, John Wesley, who was used, in, especially in UK, to bring revival, he would go on a horse around a lot of the UK, go into a field and preach, and thousands would come to the Lord. He was the founder of the Methodist church. When he died, he just had a handful of coins in his pocket. 
And yet, through his ministry, through, through his work and preaching, he saw mil- the, the equivalent of millions and millions and millions of dollars come. You know, when his first paycheck came was 30 pounds a year. <laughs> 30 pounds a year. That's like 50-something dollars a year. But in those days, 30 pounds a year would be something like 40,000 Singapore dollars a year. Something like that. Do you know? But he would give, his first check, he got 30. He kept 28 and gave two. But then the next year, it was doubled, his income. But he still kept 28 and gave away the rest into the ministry. As the years went on, his, his income triple, double, quadruple, until 10 times more, over 2,000 pounds a year came into his ministry. He still lived on the 28 pounds and gave away all the rest. And he taught this in his ministry. And when he died, they just found a few coins on him because he was living for God's kingdom. I'm not there at that, that place but I want to get to that point where I can give more and more because I love my God so much. He can have everything. He can have everything. And so this is a beautiful picture of what God wants us to get to that point where we trust him so much. We're released into that call God has for us and we're just giving everything to him. And then the, the more, so this is what we learn really, the conclusion of the whole thing. The more we lean on him, and are loved by him, the more we will labor with him in the harvest field. So we will only lean on him and trust in him if we really know he loves us. And the more we we know he loves us, the more we will trust in him, the more we will do for his glory. It's a very simple message, but very difficult to live out. And then we'll be ready to cry out for him to come. Now, some people, they, they say, I want Jesus to come because I hate my life right now. So horrible. Just come, Jesus, get, lift me up out of this pit. <laughs> no, we see, now, if we, this is the very last part here. The beloved sings out, you who dwell in the gardens, the companions listen for your voice. Let me hear it. So he's singing, the beloved is singing to his, his love, working hard in the gardens. So what's what's the bride doing? Working in the harvest fields. And and he says, let me hear your voice. And what is the voice that she gives back to him? Basically, it's the cry for him to come. So the Shulamite says, make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. So it says, come quickly. In other words, saying, come quickly, my beloved. Come and join me. And this takes us all the way to the end of Revelation. The end of Revelation, what does it say? Let's read this together. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. So come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Shall we all stand? Is that the cry of your heart? Come, Lord Jesus. But what kind of cry is it? Is it, come Lord Jesus, I'm in such a mess right now, you've got to come and sort it all out? Or is it, Lord, I'm doing your will, I'm furthering your kingdom. Matthew 24 says the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all nations, then the end will come. So the cry for him to come is while we are ministering, while we're doing his ministry. It's not trying to avoid All the pain and the suffering in this life is while we are doing his ministry, we cry, come Lord Jesus. Amen. So today the question is, how is your wall of faith? Is your wall of faith, you're strong in your trust. Wherever Jesus wants to lead you, you are following him. You have a strong wall of faith. You've been through that place where you're passionately in love with him. You've allowed him to cleanse your heart completely. And you've persevered through tribulations and trials with praise and thanksgiving and you've come forth as gold and then you've taken your place in ministry and going forth and furthering his kingdom and you're leaning fully on him. Don't worry if the answer is I'm not there yet. 
because I would say I'm not there yet as well. But I would believe God would say to you, just lean on me a little bit more today. Lean on me a little bit more than you have been doing. Trust in me more. How do we do that? It's by seeing how much he loves us. How much he loves us. So Lord, I pray today for each one of us, those watching over YouTube as well, those that are here, Lord, wherever we are, however our wall is like, whatever our wall is like, if it's weak or it's falling down or it's strong, but Lord, help us just to see how much you love us. Oh, thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that you died for us. Greater love is no man than this, than he gives up his life for his friends. So I thank you, Lord, that you have shown us your love. Forgive us, Lord, where because of darkness in our life, we, we don't fully believe that. So today, show us a bit more of your love. Show us a bit more of your love. Pour out just that bit more of your love that we can trust in you and lean on you more, Lord God. Thank you for the message of Song of Solomon, Lord God. And Lord, what we've seen is just touching the surface. I ask you to take us into the heart of your love, into the heart of the song. Take us deeper. Lead us deeper, Lord. Transform us by your love. Yes, Lord, I pray for every one of us here. Just put your hand over your heart and say, Lord, help me to trust in you more. Open up the eyes of my heart to see more of your love, how much you love me and to receive it into my life. Pour out your love right now, Lord. Oh, yes, just say to the Lord, I need more of your love, Lord. I need more of your love. Forgive me, Father. Oh, for so many times rejecting it when you want to pour out more. Oh, I want to open my heart, Lord. Receive more of your love. Yes, just lift up your hands and say, Lord, pour out your love upon me right now. Let's sing the final song. And as we sing this song, just... Allow the Lord to touch you, to pour out more of his love upon you and help you to lean a little bit more on him today. And as you go out of this place, you'll know that you've been able to just lean a bit more on Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, we adore you. Yes, Lord. Songs of love, they are for Father, the message of Song of Solomon. Thank you, Lord, that so often it's lost to the church because people just believe it's for, about human love, but my whole heart believes that it's more than that. It reveals our relationship with you, and it's so powerful. So take us into the reality of that song, that song of your love, Lord, and help us, Lord, not just be in season one, season two, but bring us through to season five perfecting love, Lord God, to help us trust in you, to lean upon you, to come out of that wilderness experience in our life. Thank you, Lord, that you will break every curse. You will, Lord, take us through every trial and 
every testing and we will come forth as gold because of your love. So Lord, help us, Lord. Open the eyes of our hearts to see the extent, the height, the depth, the width of your love in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And all the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Lift up your hands for the final blessing, the ironic blessing. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to upon you and give give you peace in the name of the Lord Jesus Hallelujah Amen, Amen May the Lord bless you and keep you May the Lord lift up his count May the Lord bless you and keep you May the Lord make his face shine upon you Be gracious to you, lift up his countenance upon you give you his shalom peace god bless you amen enjoy the rest of your weekend shalom we have come to the end of our service thank you for watching i'm gary and i'd like to welcome you to cosbt if you're joining us for service for the very first time we would love to get to know you better. So do connect with us here and feel free to share with us if you have any questions, comments, and even prayer requests. We would love to pray alongside with you. Also be sure to hit that subscribe button so that you won't miss out on our weekly sermons. Stay updated on the latest church announcements by following our Facebook and Instagram. Blessing you with a wonderful week ahead. Shalom.